I'm Andrea, a passionate DEI advocate and consultant on a mission. Join me in each episode as we celebrate diversity, ignite conversations, and craft workplaces and educational institutions where everyone thrives. This podcast is my commitment to making a meaningful impact on the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So are you ready? Let's get diversifused. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Get Diverse Views podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Horton-Richley, founder of Diverse Views DEI Consulting and a passionate DEI advocate and ally. This episode is all about emotional intelligence and its importance in transforming diversity. The title of our episode today is EQ Unleashed, Transforming Diversity with Emotional Intelligence. My guest speaker today is Monica Cotri. She's inherently diverse as a woman of color. She has experienced the impact of being othered throughout her childhood. Feeling like she belonged was a foreign concept. She therefore spent most of her childhood and early adolescent years perpetuating an immense desire to explain how she was different, whether it it was in terms of her Hindu culture and customs, religious preferences, or simply describing her native attire. Of course, all of this made her feel a huge sense of pride. Fast forward to the world we live in today, And considering how the workplace has become significantly more diverse, she's asked herself, is this all that at the expense of a sense of belonging and feeling respected despite our differences? This question has set the foundation for her deep desire to career pivot into diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. She wants to be at the forefront of instituting much needed change in this space, no matter how difficult or challenging. So with this, I welcome Monica, to get diverse views. Thank you for being our first guest on our our first episode. Thank you so much, Andrea, for an absolutely fantastic and heartfelt introduction. Um, I think your your description uh, of me is is spot on accurate. And uh, I'd like to start off with just a real short story. Um, There I was on the bus on my way home from middle school, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, all I could hear was this obnoxious voice yelling at me. He was screaming at the top of his lungs, go back to Gandhi land, go back to Gandhi land. Why are you here? I was trembling, uh, petrified, counting the minutes to make it to my my bus stop. Uh, Once the bus made it to my my stop, Mm -hmm. uh, I, Didn't really know what to do. I froze, but I I got up to get off the bus. As I was getting off the bus, um, this boy who was still yelling and screaming Mm -hmm. uh, bit in my hair and kicked me from behind. Did the bus driver do anything? Bus driver didn't do anything at all, to be honest, (laughs) Andrea. Which today I, you know, it's it's heart wrenching, but yeah. um, I I got off the bus, ran home, and spent the rest of the evening sobbing in my room. Mm. Um, all I could say to myself was, why is this happening to me? Yeah. And I asked you in the audience, have you ever felt this way? Uh, I have, um, as a, a mixed race Latina. Um, I grew up in as a military brat. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a military brat is, uh, one or or both of my parents were in the military. In this case, it was my father, um, and I uh, n- never knew. Uh, my mother actually spoke Spanish because <laughs> my father's white uh, and does not speak Spanish. My mother is Mexican American and uh, was born in Veracruz, um, and um, when my father retired, um, we moved to Texas, Um, El Paso, it's a border town. And I actually was born there. I don't remember being born there, of course, but I was born there. And uh, I finished my schooling there, but um, since I didn't speak Spanish, it was, uh, El Paso, as I said, is a border town and it's very uh, Latin, uh, huge Latin population, uh, Mexican American population, and and, um, also um, African American or, or black population from the military as well um because there's a huge base there um and i felt excluded um 
from my friends because I didn't know where I belonged. It was I white or, or was I Hispanic? I, I don't know because my I was I wasn't his, Hispanic enough because I didn't speak Spanish, and I wasn't white enough because I didn't look white. Uh, so I was like in this gray area of not really fitting in. And when my um, Spanish speaking friends um, didn't want to include me in the conversation, they would change to their native tongue, which is hurtful for a child. Um, it feels you, it makes you feel excluded. It, it's hurtful for anybody when you're in a conversation with some, some friends or some colleagues and, and then it just turns to the native tongue and then you're kind of pushed to the side. Um, now, I'm not saying that it's, it's um, you should never speak in your native tongue. Of course, I encourage you guys, just, everybody who speaks another language who's, uh, who, whose native language is not English to continue that those customs and cultures. Um, but um, just be cognizant of people around you because it does make people feel excluded if they were in the conversation initially. Um, but it's code yeah, switching. Would... Say it, that again? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Andrea. It's code mm -hmm. switching, right? You know, when you're when you're in a conversation and yes. and mm -hmm. and you I've experienced that myself firsthand. You know, you you automatically mm -hmm. feel like you feel othered. You feel less yes. than other. You know, yeah. what what you know, are they are they talking about me? Are they yeah. saying something mm -hmm. about me? Right? Yeah. Um like I was in this conversation so, before, but now I'm not. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, all your your insecurities ask you these questions so yeah it's it's a very um I felt that um so uh, I've never had anybody spit in my hair uh, as you have um which I'm so sorry that happened to you um and I've um uh, I've witnessed um as a child uh similar things um and I was actually a brave job because I, I actually stood up for uh, my friends um and um and put a stop to it but I'm so sorry nobody stood up for you uh in your time of need especially the adult on the bus <laughs> whose job uh, it was it, well, um, well you're you're absolutely right Andrea I mean mm -hmm. I um it's it's a core memory that I will never forget but mm -hmm. I think it leads us to this question uh that you and I can very well ask the audience is what is missing mm -hmm. in the case of this boy who is bullying me right Mm -hmm. And what do you think was missing in the case of this 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 boy? Why was he behaving the way he was? Yeah. Emotional right? intelligence. <laughs> emotional intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, but then um I guess I I pivot again and ask you this question. How can a middle school aged boy have emotional intelligence when we see EI absent emotional intelligence, EI absent in many adults? Yeah. Right? So I'd like you to actually highlight something that you stated so beautifully in one of your recent newsletters mm -hmm. that I think really speaks to, really speaks to my story. Sure. Uh, so a few weeks ago um, in my newsletter on LinkedIn uh, called the EI Digest, um, I had a newsletter um, that um, expanded on one of my blog posts, uh, my company's blog posts. And the newsletter was called Bringing DEI Home, Lessons from Childhood to the Boardroom. Uh, so um, it talked about, um, it, well, it reflected on the DEI lessons we've carried since our earliest days, recognizing that DEI is not a recent addition, but is a fundamental fabric woven into the very essence of humanity. Uh, so if you think about it, in, in primary school, elementary school, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> um, kindergarten through five, fifth, sixth grade, um, teachers usually have that golden rule posted at the front or somewhere near the front of the classroom treat others as you want to be treated um and so that is the beginnings of the teachings of emotional intelligence trying to put um uh yourself in their shoes but um it also expands into the platinum rule which i heard um a few months ago i had never heard it called the platinum rule before um and i love love it it's called treat others the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated, because we all have our own bubble that we sort of live in, our own lens that we see things through and experience things through. Uh, so that platinum rule goes beyond that. And that includes, um, expands on emotional intelligence to include empathy. 
Um, and um, I loved that term the first time I heard it and I, I kind of stole it. So I'm because <laughs> it is just fantastic, the platinum rule. Treat others and, how they want to be treated. Um, so Andrea, I think that's fabulous. You know, I think if if I were to have the opportunity to create uh, marketing paraphernalia for organizations across corporate mm -hmm. America, I think it would have to be the platinum rule because you know we, it may no. I mean, yeah, it, it I may, love it. I mean, what I'm saying is, is it may seem very simple and mm -hmm. maybe to some obvious, but yeah. you know, in the real world. Sometimes it isn't that obvious, right? No, and you're right. Um, you know, if you tie it back to uh, what you stated earlier with regards to um, elementary school, whether it's kindergarten, first grade, mm -hmm. fifth grade, um, I would almost feel like if you think about it through a different lens, you know, our teachers were trying to build a psychologically safe space for us as children. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fast forward to all of us as adults. Um, in your personal space and in your workspace, the mm -hmm. goal remains the same. Is mm -hmm. it a psychologically safe space to allow for difference of thought, difference of opinion, right? Yes. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but some may perceive emotional intelligence as a weakness. Mm -hmm. However, do you agree that emotional intelligence uh, is the backbone of DEIB? I agree because um, without um, emotional intelligence, you can't have empathy. And empathy is, to me anyway, the basis of DEI. Um, because it's, it's with empathy, you're aware of your surroundings, uh, of the people and the situations that are going on in your surroundings. And when you're aware, you can act. Um, and <laughs> when you think of um, uh, to bring in workplace harassment, uh, discrimination issues or classroom harassment and discrimination issues, classroom is where you learn, hey, there's a consequence if, for misbehavior. <laughs> um, so it, it's also teaching that, that um, the legalities of uh, right and wrong as well and to a certain extent, because uh, as you get older, there's consequences if you break the law. And uh, it, not all DEI components are Ill, um, like infarctions, infarctions, infarctions are illegal, uh, but some are. And so um, you have to know the consequences of your actions, the impact your actions have, not just on the other person, but on the, the other people around you, on you and your loved ones. Um, and so, uh, yeah, without empathy, um, none of, to me, the domino effect stops. So, and and I think Andrea, you highlighted very beautifully a very key point where um, empathy doesn't simply apply to one single individual. It's the collective mm -hmm. energy, right? Um, yeah. Where um, if to one person, if one person feels that in such a way due to their upbringing or their background or their cultural upbringing, mm -hmm. they, they shouldn't be made to feel less than by someone who is possibly of a different culture. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a situation where we're working together to, to build that level of collective empathy mm -hmm. that should eventually lead to increased collaboration. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to add, uh, Farah Harris, she's mm -hmm. written the book, The Color of Emotional Intelligence, Elevating yes. Our Self and Social Awareness to Address Inequities. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say to you and to the audience that uh, Farah's book is a must read. Um, Andrea, as I mentioned to you earlier today, I think it should be a must read for high school students, college students, and I almost feel like it should be a must read for professionals in the workplace. Um, and yeah, you know, I loved it. And I thank you that you uh, introduced me to her. I had not heard of her before, so thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, once again, the, her book is The Color of Emotional Intelligence, mm -hmm. Elevating Our Self and Social Awareness to Address Inequities. She, she, there's a very strong, um, strong is just not a sufficient adjective to use, but toward the tail end of her book, 
she states very eloquently, quote, uh, our emotional intelligence has mm-hmm. suffered from a sad case of glaucoma and colorblindness mm-hmm. that has deteriorated our ability to see each other clearly. Mm-hmm. When flashes of reality come into our sight, she states, we request blindness once more, hoping to unsee the role we play that silences, disenfranchises, marginalizes, and discriminates against and ignores certain humans. Oh, that's powerful. And if you really, if you really break down what she's stated, Andrea, it's mm-hmm. it says it all, right? Where yeah. she, if I, if I'm understanding her correctly. In order for there to be collective emotional intelligence, we have to look within first, mm-hmm. right? We all have, we, we all naturally have ABC biases, right? But yeah. we, we, we have to look within. And if I understand her very creative way of expressing this, we have to get beyond that blindness, right? Yeah. We can't. We we can't continue to remain um, blind to those marginalized groups, those mm-hmm. those groups that are uh, uh, discriminated against repeatedly, right? Yeah. So I think she makes a very very powerful point where she says, "Don't." And this is breaking it down into very crude terms. Don't point your finger at somebody else, but look within first. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. and, and hmm. it's just, that speaks volumes because, hmm. you know, we may not all look at it through that lens, right? Hmm. Um, You know, naturally we as humans are ego driven, right? So our ego says, oh, no, I'm right. But no, hmm. we, we, we have to take a step back and, and and do some internal self analysis and say, okay, well, how can I how can I how can I change my tr- way of thinking? How mm-hmm. can I uh, be more flexible in thought? How can I be more open minded? Right. So I just yeah. thought that was she closes her book. This is like the second to last second to last page of her book, but I just thought this. This statement, uh, um, if you really break it down, mm-hmm. it really makes you think. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, as you were uh, going over the quote, it. I had a flashback of a book I um, that actually eventually became a movie uh, in the two thousand. I believe it was the two thousands. Um, I I taught it uh, to my um, middle school students when I was a teacher way back when, and um, it's called The Giver. And I don't know if you read the book and or saw the movie. I think the movie had um, Jeff Bridges in it who portrayed the giver. It was basically a world in a huge bubble. It was separated from the rest of the world. And everybody saw things in black and white. Everybody was required to take a a shot to keep them colorblinded. uh, And and everybody was assigned their roles and everything. um, there could be no twins. Uh, they didn't think of anything of, of, about uh, killing the the second twin off. Once you reached a certain age, you went to the beyond or something like that, and nobody knew what happened until uh, somebody. You know, it, it's just um, I'm not going to give the whole story away, but uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, I think it was Lowry is the author, if I remember, um, and um, a movie was pretty good as well um hey it's Jeff Bridges he <laughs> every movie's good with him and uh but that we request blindness once more uh that's what reminded me of that that story uh that the only way that's the extreme that's how they thought they could solve all the problems was making everybody colorblind and you can't it's not part of our human nature um our differences are what make us unique and beautiful in the world um and those uh colors those um different customs it's what makes us unique as as um as mammals uh to this wonderful planet of ours um and 
Yeah. It's, Absolutely. And I think yeah. I, I think I would echo something you stated, Andrew, which is um, in terms of the, I, I like the analogy you made with the movie. No, I have not seen the movie and I have not read the book, but it's going to be added to my list <laughs> of books. Um, but I think the analogy is quite strong because if you think about what Farrah states in her book and what's being presented in The Giver, it, it, okay, I'm just oversimplifying something that's obviously considerably more in depth. Mm -hmm. We can't lead life colorblind, right? No. We can't, we can't, we can't lead life if we, if our desire is to achieve emotional intelligence and, and function from, from a point of empathy, then we can't mm -hmm. live in black and white. Exactly. Right? Because that's just and, and ignoring I, the ignoring the issues. Ex exactly. Becoming exactly. Complacent. And mm -hmm. complacent. Yes. And I mm -hmm. think and, and 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 I think that's what that sort of um Farah's call to action, right? Where she says that um if we want to achieve some level of emotional intelligence collectively, we have mm -hmm. to understand that we cannot be blind to our inherent diversity. We cannot be blind to our inherent yet b beautiful differences, right? Yeah. And I thought that was just, I thought that was really, really powerful. Um, yeah. uh, let's see here. So, I, I, I want to get your thoughts on this. Yeah. So when we think about leadership, emotional intelligence, right? Um, and obviously, leadership's emotional intelligence quotient is tested most during challenging times, mm -hmm. right? So I ask yeah, you this question, Andrea. Uh, I ask you this question. So um, unfortunately, uh, in the world we live in today, um, just since the beginning of 2024, um, there have mm -hmm. been massive layoffs after layoffs yeah. after layoffs, right? Mm -hmm. And my question is, although layoffs are conducted to preserve the bottom line, mm -hmm. are we to assume that EQ levels are non-existent as thousands of people are losing their livelihoods? Something. Uh, That's a great, great question. And um, I just wanted to give Jennifer Brown here a plug with uh, How to Be an Inclusive Leader. <laughs> Great book if you haven't read it. Um, it uh, talks a little bit about, um, it doesn't specifically state emotional intelligence, but as we said before, in order to be inclusive, which is part of DEI, you have to have emotional intelligence to have that empathy. Um, and now with the, the tech, as we, this world has gotten more tech, this is my opinion. Um, it's, it's not based on any research. Um, as the world has gotten more tech, um, we've lost that human com uh, human component. Uh, you can see it even in the the uh, the job search. Um, everything's online, uh, whereas 20 years ago, um, you would have to go in person to an organization, mm -hmm. any company, to apply, uh, and you had that human interaction, uh, that rapport was was built, and. Uh, and you, they put a face to the name, and now you're just a number. You're an applicant ID uh, with, associated with a job rec number in their applicant tracking system. Um, there's still a few smaller mo mom and pop type shops that still do in-person applications, but um, 90 plus percent of the world is all online. Um, so with that, um, it's the same when it comes to layoffs. They're looking at the screen. They're looking at the numbers. Uh, and um, it's it's easy to do subtraction when it's on the screen, when you don't have to put the faces to the names um, or sometimes not even the names to the numbers. <laughs> um, it's like, okay, this, this department has to eliminate this many people because they're looking at the salaries. How can we, and they're trying to save uh, people's jobs at the same time. Uh, so they're looking at where they can cut. So EQ is partially there, but it's also missing. Um, especially for those companies that don't offer, um, or what are those kind of um, 
packages called where they have a training component to get you retrained to do something else uh, um, as part of the the um, termination package. Um, so yeah, to me, EQ, it's, it's not non-existent, but it's severely diminished when it comes to um, the layoffs in, in the tech and med medical industries. I mean, there were so many layoffs over the past few years. Um, I'm hoping 2024 starts to, they start to decrease um, in the number of layoffs, but um, yeah, EQ, um, it's, uh, that, that's out to me, that's sort of a gray area with EQ because it's there and it's not at the same time. Um, you know, you, you said it beautifully, Andrea, because it's heartbreaking, but mm -hmm. you said it correctly where, you know, you feel like you're just a number, right? Yeah. Okay. Organizations are looking at their financials. Oh, okay. Well, we need to uh, decrease by X amount of dollars. Um, how are we going to do it through layoffs? And we're just going to do mm -hmm. widespread layoffs, right? And yeah. and you're right. EQ is, you're right in saying that EQ is non-existent, but to say that it is painfully diminished uh, uh, is, uh, I would say, um, spot on accurate. Um, mm -hmm. That leads me into, that segues in uh, well into another point I wanted to share, which was, sure. which is that to build a space of belonging, uh, mm -hmm. it's critical to ensure diversity of thought is shared, reflected upon and respected. Right. Um, so I follow um, a woman by the name of Denise Jeffrey on LinkedIn. She's the founder of AI Business Dynamics. Ooh. Okay. And uh, I believe she's out of um, I believe she's out of Europe, but I don't remember clearly. And she states, quote, that a great leader embodies a trinity of quotients. Intelligence quotient, emotional intelligence quotient, and social intelligence quotient. And she states, she states that social intelligence quotient is the social glue in leadership, enabling the cultivation of deep meaningful connections. Deep meaningful connections can only be made if diversity, equity, and inclusion are the core elements of driving those connections and relationships. And I oh, just I wanted to get your I wanted to get your thoughts on that because mm -hmm. I never really I never really looked or I never really contemplated over leadership. Mm -hmm. or the concept of leadership as, as lending itself to this trinity of quotients. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Actually, I love that quote. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to look, look her up. Um, but yeah, uh, so intelligence quotients, I, IQ, everybody knows what, um, or most people know what IQ is. It's how smart you are when it comes to academic type stuff and, and the, doing the, the job duties. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, for the most part, that stuff can be taught, right? Uh, to a certain extent. Emotional intelligence, as we were talking about, is uh, EQ, uh, which is the ability to understand your own emotions uh, and manage your own emotions in positive ways. So as you can uh, relieve your stress, communicate more effectively, empathize with others, and overcome challenges and um, help diffuse conflicts that you may um, experience or, or uh, witness. Um, and social intelligence is your ability to relate to other people. Um, so a leader, a great leader, they have to know how to do their job, the SEIQ, uh, the duties of their job, the emotional intelligence and the social intelligence, they have to be able to relate to others um, uh, because it's, um, it's all about a relationship building, depending on your level of leadership. It could be getting uh, funds to keep your business going. You have to be relatable and be able to have that woo factor. Um, and when it comes to um, emotional intelligence, it's leading others. You have to be able to read your people uh, so you can pair the right uh, people together for um, for good teamwork and, and, and know uh, how to... Um, manage conflicts 
that on teams so they can work even better together. Um, and uh, a true leader knows that diverse teams work best together. Um, they produce better. They are more innovative and creative. Um, this actually reminded me, as you were talking, um, saying this quote, it reminded me of a former CEO I had at a, a, a nonprofit I used to work at. Um, and this happened, this situation that I'm going to talk about happened before I got there. Um, and before I started working there, um, my, um, my director, or sorry, my manager at the time had told me um, ab about what he did and, uh, because she was so it made that much of a positive impact on her. So it was a, a non small nonprofit at the time. It it had grown by the time I started there, and um, and he was um from a wealthyish type of family, but he uh you know did his time with a uh, with the um what's called uh Peace Corps and everything, um and um he loved giving back. And it was during a huge recession time while he was CEO, they lost um, a lot of their funds. And instead of um, laying people off because he knew the economy was um, not good, it would be really hard to further his, his, his uh, team to find other jobs in that economy. He paid everybody out of pocket and did not tell anybody. And he wasn't as all, he had social awkwardness. So he wasn't a hundred percent well-liked by everybody, but they, nobody did not, not like him, you know? Um, but um, he was a little socially awkward <laughs> um, to some, he came off that as socially awkward to some people. Uh, very nice, very nice um, gentleman. And, but he, so that shows how great of a leader he was he had that emotional intelligence and that social intelligence as well. And that awareness, not just of his, his own, uh, the company that he, uh, the nonprofit he managed, but of the, the, the local economy. Um, so it's, um, that to me is a great example of a great leader um, because he showed all three quotients, um, uh, the Trinity of quotients. Um, at that time. What a beautiful, powerful example, Andrea, because if I would just add in saying that he, this, this, this gentleman, uh, CEO of this nonprofit is, is also to some degree, the personification of heart-centered leadership, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, uh, I don't know very many CEOs who would necessarily um, take those, uh, yeah, take those steps, right? And mm -hmm. and I agree, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. He does. He absolutely personifies that trinity of quotients because he obviously, you know, although you mentioned, you know, he may appear as somewhat socially awkward to certain individuals mm -hmm. he had developed those meaningful connections yes. with his team and mm -hmm. and because those connections were genuine and deep it just it, it almost sounds like it came naturally for him to behave in yeah. that fashion mm -hmm. right I mean and, and, and he and never he, expected a thank you he didn't even let it be known except to his second that well that's it so, yeah Thank you for sharing that example because yeah, that's that's welcome. amazing. I think that's a great example of of uh, Denise's uh, um, trinity of quotients. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, allow you to elaborate on this um, yeah. question. Um, I have for you is sure. uh, so obviously February is Black History Month. Um, yes. And uh, I have a question for you. Um, sure. Can we as a society be selective in respecting diversity? Are we supposed to be selective or what are your thoughts? Oh, man. Um, so, no. <laughs> those, those are my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> So diversity, you don't know how some how diverse someone is just by looking at them. Um, we, um, as humans, tend to make assumptions. Um, it's just in our human nature. Um, and assumptions often tend, or tend to often be incorrect or not fully correct. Um, 
And so um, we have to respect people for who they are, what they bring to the table, their experiences, their cultures, their customs. Um, so um, even though I I love that February is Black History Month and I love that October is Hispanic, <laughs> you know, Heritage Month. <laughs> um, uh, and and there's, you know, uh, Pride Month in June and Juneteenth. And I mean, there's just, um, the whole, every month has its um, numerous observances that that particular month has, um, which are very important. But to me, um, I think it was one of my uh, recent newsletters also, um, uh, maybe this week's, I can't remember, um, uh, or last week's, I should say, um, like, um, it's important to celebrate diversity throughout the entire year. So, um, and, and that's for everybody. So people, uh, whether it's in workplaces or educational institutions or just in the community at large, um, should find reasons to um, learn about other people and or cultures or customs that you're not familiar with. Um, that should be, to me, that sh should be like a action item uh, um, that people should um, uh, strive to have to, to learn about one new um, culture, custom, um, uh, something in history um, each, at least each month if not each day or each every day or every week. Um, but um, because if we don't learn about other people that are not, that are not in our, our bubble of life, um, we're never going to grow as humans. Um, we're never going to respect diversity if we don't travel. Um, like I live in a place where <laughs> Uh, some people never even cross a river, ha have never crossed a river in their life, have never left their tiny little borough. Um, and I'm like, wow, it's like you, you need to expand your mind. And, and it's one thing to read it in a book. It's another whole other experience to have that um, actual immersion of experiences, like tasting that, that wonderful the fl flavors of the food, uh, whether it's um, maybe a uh, uh, Mexican food, if you're in, uh, I'll use Mambales country, Veracruz, or if you're in um, my uh, husband's native country, Turkey, um, uh, Mediterranean cuisine, um, German food, if you're in Germany, um, it, it's um, just, uh, I mean, it opens up your mind um, and it um, opens up your, your narrow lens of that uh, you've had, because if all your you're seen as what's on TV, whether it's uh, whatever particular news station or stations you listen to, whatever news media you might read, or um, maybe you're just talking to your family members and friends or whatever. Um, if that's your only your only resources, um, then you're making other you're allowing others to make up your mind for you. Um, I believe in uh, human centeredness. I believe in um, a, a blank slate. Um, I believe in like, I'm going to make up my own mind by learning and experiencing. Um, and I'm so glad I did it. I stepped out of my comfort zone about 12 or so. Well, actually, I was military brat before, but, but 12 or so years ago, I went and lived in another country. And I was like, and um some of my family members are like, oh no, it's going to be like a, they were scared. You know, it's like, you're going to get kidnapped or something. It's like, um, most hospitable country I've ever lived in. Um, friendliest cult, uh, people. Um, it's, um, a beautiful country. Um, and it's, uh, it just expanded my, um, uh, mind to want to learn more, you know, um, or, or I would say expand my mind, but it, it uh, sparked that interest. It's like, hey, you know, um, I'm gonna, you know, these people are not how I was taught. You know, I'm gonna then it's the same way for the rest of the world. I'm gonna go <laughs> start expanding. So diversity, you should you should not be selective at all in um in res when it comes to respecting diversity. Um, you should be an open uh, an open forum for it. So to respect all diversity in all its forms.
and shapes. Oh, and I think colors. that's a, I think that's a great segue into sort of my my challenge statement to you, which is, um, if we think about the LGBTQ plus community, um, obviously, as you're aware. I feel like there isn't a day or a week that goes by that there is increased legislation um, being passed, uh, making the lives of the LGBTQ plus community uh, increasingly mm -hmm. more painful and difficult. Um, the reason why I cite the LGBTQ plus community as an example is whether it's cultural differences, whether it's linguistic differences, whether it's um, gender-based differences, whatever the differences may be, mm -hmm. I, I, the question I have to you and to the audience is that uh, why all of this legislation in opposition uh, mm -hmm. with the LGBTQ plus community? They, those individuals um, are not to be othered. They're not to be mm -hmm. felt. Ma ma they're not to be made to feel less than. Mm -hmm. They simply want to lead a normal life. You know, they mm -hmm. want to. They 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 want to be gainfully employed. Um, they want to be uh, um, happily together with their significant others. Why is it that um, we have? to ask ourselves why is it that there is still so much divisiveness why is there still so much uh um legislation for example that is and and again it's and i have to say this uh only because this yeah. is something i read recently that uh <clears throat> maryland maryland go go maryland the state <laughs> of maryland they uh i don't live in maryland but i'm close to it here in virginia <laughs> Um, they recently passed, I don't remember all of the intricacies of the legislation, but they recently passed considerable legislation in support of the LGBTQ plus community, which uh, was a little bit of a rarity to see and hear, um, considering the opposite seems to be mainstream right now. Yeah. And, and I just, I, I wanted to sort of interject with that example, because I yeah. think in, in order for us to in order for us to, as, as a collective, in order for mm -hmm. us to increase our levels of emotional intelligence and simultaneously truly be empathetic, yeah, that can only be achieved if all of this othering behavior stops, right? Yeah. Until this, and until the othering behavior stops, <clears throat> or, uh, uh well, until it stops, I don't mm. know that we can necessarily achieve that collective level of unity, if you will. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's and it's painful to see. Um, it, it's just it's painful to see all those examples, right? Because at the end of the day, what we're saying is is we cannot be selective in respecting diversity. And the goal is to achieve allyship, right? Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how, how do we as a society um, achieve allyship? And what does that have to do um, with our own lived unique experiences? How do we achieve allyship? That's a great question. So um, it's, to me anyway, it's to... Um, you have to conquer your fears by stepping out of your comfort zone. Uh, Cause to, uh, to me, the, the um, adversity we're seeing to DEI initiatives and um, in, in certain marginalized communities like our, our LGBTQ plus uh, friends um, stems from fear of the, of, of differences and fear of um, based on assumptions and stereotypes and the unknown. <clears throat> and so it's basically, you have to conquer those fears by stepping out of your comfort zone and educating yourself um, on these communities. Like I said before, the action item uh, uh, that I would love um, our listeners today to, to do is to um, at least learn about one, um, one uh, 
culture, uh, types of people, uh, uh, customs, um, uh, religion, whatever it may be that you don't know about or that you think you know, but you're not sure. You just know from what you've been told or what you've heard. Um, learn about them. Go in and um, and uh, to a, um, uh, visit a country or, or watch a doc some documentaries um, that have been vetted. Um, and it's, uh, that's how, where it's going to start is, um, this, um, the turning of, of the tides when it comes to, uh, uh, DEI and, and the initiatives in the United States. Um, it's, it, it stems from fear and we have to just conquer it by, by educating ourselves and, um, and uh, eliminating our, um, not basing our reactions on assumptions and, and fear and stereotypes. Um, it's, uh, I mean, to and me, knowledge is power. Oh, I, I let me say that again. Knowledge is power. Um, yes. And you said it, you, you said it beautifully. Um, Educate, educate, educate. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I read somewhere that you know life is a, a lifelong learning process, right? And um, I, I want to add on uh, Lisa Hurley, who is the founder of the Great Exhale, and she's an award-winning mm -hmm. activist. Um, <laughs> she said something so powerful. It's but a few words, but she says we are qualified by life, and I. Love I just think about that for a second, right? Mm -hmm. We are qualified by life. So I would like to, I don't know if Lisa is listening right now, but I'd like to add on to her pretty powerful statement by saying that we defer, you know, we refers to all diverse groups, right? Yeah. Whether, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's individuals of the Jewish faith, Palestinians, South Asians, the LGBTQ plus uh, community, indigenous peoples, and, and many others, right? I think what she's trying to say in what, but one, two, three, four, five words <laughs> mm -hmm. is <laughs> that our diverse lived experiences yeah. set the foundation for our varying perspectives and thoughts. And until we collectively as a society step back and away from stereotypes and assumptions, as you stated, mm -hmm. how are we going to build that level of emotional intelligence? How are we going to build that understanding of, of diversity? How are we going to then take that understanding of diversity into building inclusive environments? Right. Yeah. Um, it's a, it, as you said earlier, it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful domino effect. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think at the core of that domino effect uh, effect is what you stated just a few moments ago, which is knowledge is power. Yeah. We need to educate ourselves better. We can't we can't. Uh, I, I always think of uh, the, that image comes to mind of, you know, having tunnel vision. No, oh, you know, yeah. we have to you, you said yeah. it earlier. We have to open our minds to to differing perspectives and different mm -hmm. because because that's how and 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 color, correct me if i'm wrong hmm. isn't that how true collaboration can be achieved right if, yeah. if we think about it for a second right um so i i i just think that's something that i'd like our audience to to think about today which is mm -hmm. um as you said what measures can I take mm -hmm. as a individual myself and as a member of the audience, what can I do to, to broaden my sense of understanding and to minimize, because we all have inherent biases, right? Oh, it's, yeah. just, it's, mm -hmm. it's a natural human tendency, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But what, what are we as as intelligent individuals, what are we doing collectively as a society to to break down this divisiveness, right? What mm -hmm. are we doing to to make ourselves whole, right? I think that is really something um, 
which is why it leads me to this next question for you, which okay. is how do we celebrate how do we celebrate diversity, Andrea, while creative, excuse me, while creating an inclusive culture? How do we accomplish both goals? How do we go yeah. about doing that? Um, I mean, inclusivity is all about celebrating diversity. Uh, you can't you can't be inclusive without being diversive. Um, I mean, without sorry, you can't be inclusive <laughs> without having diversity. <laughs> there we go. Um, and um, it's. I mean, that's where, um, like, in the workplace, ERGs, you know, um, em employee resource groups. Um, I, at my last position, um, there was this one called Culture Group, and they uh, uh, were all about educating um, the teams on, um, like, the different themed months, like Black History Month, Hispanic Heritage Month, um, uh, Juneteenth. Um, we uh they uh, the the that team uh the ERG team uh represented by each location um uh made sure to put together with the director um at that location um celebrate celebration activities informational activities for the for the teams and uh, it, it was um it was celebrating diversity some of them were like let's bring in some let's have a uh uh, we had um, for his one of the Hispanic heritage ones was we had loteria, which is the Mexican bingo, and we had uh, Mexican pastries, and we uh, talked about um, uh, some um, uh, Mexican history and and culture. So it was it was so fun. Um, and uh, on Veterans Day, we gave back to veterans. Um, it's as a as a team, we we the we had that whole day off and. Uh, we uh, to uh, volunteer at a veterans organization. It was wonderful. Um, it's and and we did it as a team, so everybody was included. And it wasn't required. Th that's another thing. You cannot mandate things, um, or else people are going to find it as an, uh, an uh, a chore. Uh, you have to um, make it fun and voluntary. And I was surprised how many of the team went, pretty much everybody did. The only ones who didn't were uh, sick and had to be out of town, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, for, for certain things. And it's just, it was just wonderful. Um, and it, when you're, when you celebrate diversity, people come together um, and, and not just your team, but other departments. They're like, Hey, what's going on here? And, and they pop in, you know, um, and it's, it just includes everybody, you know, it's like, if you're, everyone's welcome, if you want to join us. Um, and because the more, the more people who celebrate, the more, um, uh, the better the team cohesiveness in the office is going to be, the better this, the, uh, the student cohesiveness and cohesiveness in the classroom is going to be, um, like having little parties, little celebrations, or or fun activities in the classroom, um, uh, or watching movies and then talking about it, like a um, uh, an approved film uh, for a certain um, type of event, uh, like um, uh, what's the, that one? Uh, I can't remember the that uh, uh, um, uh, cartoon one that came, didn't come out uh, too long ago. Um, but um, I cannot remember the name of it. Uh, Coco <laughs> was one, Coco was one of them. Uh, but there was another one that was uh, really cute, also. Uh, that was about El Encanto, El Encanto. Um, and it talked about Latin America, and and some other culture. But it was a fun movie, and and it really gets it could uh could be a nice assignment for students to do watch and then talk about. Um. And and bring food and things like that. It, it's um, that's a way to celebrate diversity is making it fun and uh, educational at the same time, um, and it opens people's eyes up no matter what age they are, um, because especially when there's food, <laughs> people tend to talk more and be more happy and be happier. So um, and and they let their guards down uh, to a certain extent, and it's um, 
it, it's it's just a wonderful thing. So that's how um, one of the strategies I like to use when it comes to uh, celebrating diversity to it help improve inclusivity in uh, whatever space it may be at. So, and you know, I think you highlighted. To, to to maybe give our audience a, a small homework assignment. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think <laughs> uh, I think I, I think you you said it you, you highlighted <laughs> something you highlighted something really yeah. important, Andrea, which is um ERGs. Uh mm -hmm. you know I can't I can't tell you how how disheartening it is to see so many organizations where ERGs are non-existent, mm -hmm. um, where, um, you know, there are still organizations within corporate America who don't quite see the value of those groups. Mm -hmm. And and that really forces me to think that, you know, why? Why? I mean, um, at the end of the day, um, as far as problem solving and collective decision making is concerned in the workplace, mm -hmm. if if varying perspectives from you know the d diverse group of individuals that that constitute an organization's employee base, if all those perspectives, maybe not all of them, but if if varying perspectives can be taken into consideration, mm -hmm. it's safe to say that that would hopefully lead to better decision making right yeah. mm -hmm. um whereas if it's a situation where certain groups of individuals are feeling siloed and and basically non-existent and unappreciated yeah. what is that going to lead to right we have mm -hmm. to think about that too and so yeah. i think it's it's very important for us to to realize the the value of ergs and how ergs mm -hmm. are intimately connected to what yeah. you stated early on um, here this evening uh, to the, the the underlying fabric of DEIB, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you can think about, if we can build this, this picture in the minds of our audience as, oh, a, okay, DEIB in action is through ERGs, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> how are we going to, I mean, again, I'm just oversimplifying something that's significantly more yeah, intricate. That's one of the one of the one of the strategies. One of the mechanisms, yes. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. One of the mechanisms. And mm -hmm. I think what I wanted to share here is a gentleman who I follow on LinkedIn. He is okay. a culture and DIE integration uh specialist. His okay. name is Kelly Black his name is Kelly Blackman. Okay. And he stated in fact in one of his posts on LinkedIn today itself, he states and I thought this was this was pretty amazing. He states, inclusion is the glue that binds diversity. Without it, our efforts may result in colorful but disconnected dots rather than a united, vibrant rainbow. Ooh. You know what? That just put an image in my head of when you said disconnected dots was uh, when you're downloading a picture, an image, and it's it hasn't come in through yet and it's still downloading it's getting yep. all kind of blurred and pixel. It's like you you can't see what it is. It's just a big mess. And it's like, but once things start coming together and, and gluing and sticking and um and there's uh no space, um, you know, it's all meshed together, it's clear and um and beautiful. All the colors come through, the vibrant colors, the images, the expressions, if they're people or animals in there. Um, it, it it's yeah, it's wonderful. And and also inclusion, it's it's very important to say that you cannot have the eye. Uh, you, you cannot have inclusion without the eye. So that means that to me, you every person is very important when it comes to promoting an inclusive space. Um and it's not about the others. It's about what can you do to help? What can I do to help promote an inclusive space? So, so beautifully said, Andrea. And I, I just, I, I, I really want to echo Kelly's, uh, it just, it just, you know, it, to me, it, it, it really brings about a different perspective where he says, inclusion is the glue 
that binds diversity, right? It's one Beautiful. thing for us to all to be different. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. We learned that, you know, you know, as we started out in our early childhood years. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we're all different and we need to respect our differences. But mm -hmm. in, if we fast forward to the workplace and as adults, yes, we have to recognize diversity. But how are we going to turn that into a positive force? Well, yeah. we're going to do that by through inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. So it, I, I thought that was just, um, and the United Vibrant Rainbow, Rainbow. metaphor, I thought was. Yeah, was yeah. because um, after the rain comes the rainbow and in, in full color. And so, yeah, I mean, when, if you don't have a DEI initiatives in your work yet, <clears throat> to me, I mean, it's going to be a little shaky getting it started. Um, you know, that's the rainstorm and the, and the wind and the darkness and the rain. But once, once that, once you're through that, those humps and everything like, like that, um, the sun's going to come out and that rainbow's going to shine. Um, it's, it's going to be a beautiful thing, but it, there are, it, I mean, there will always be, um, um, I would say backlash, but there'll always be skeptics. And um, you cannot let that dis those, as uh, Kelly said, those disconnected dots um, are skeptics <clears throat> prevent you from finishing your rainbow. So. Andrea, I, I think that is, that metaphor is so strong. I think it, it mm -hmm. I think what I would want to add is, At the end of the day, if we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, mm -hmm. we really just sit back and think about it for one second. Mm -hmm. This is not, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is not uh, a new novel concept, right? Mm -hmm. This no. is, this, the concept of DEIB should be at the core of any organizational structure, yeah. right? Um, you, you, you said it beautifully where you said, okay, there may be rough terrain mm -hmm. um, for organizations who for some don't even on a rudimentary level understand DEI mm -hmm. and but what is it going to take? It's going to yeah. take a collective effort. It's going yeah. to take a collective effort across all levels of leadership right yeah, yeah. um it, it's it's going to it's going to require a mindset shift and i think most importantly mm -hmm. andrea if you agree with me i think it's going to take consistency and constant oh, reinforcement yeah. mm -hmm. right it's not yeah. a one and done oh okay you know i've ticked the box oh you know okay i'm done no yeah. no it yeah. is it is um it, it has to be a a clearly defined component of an organizational structure that mm -hmm. that is that is present in day to day business activities, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not. It's not. Uh, and I think um, again, this is just my assessment and and insights. But I think the reason for the backlash, and it ties back to our core message here, is is the lack of understanding. Right? Yeah, we have to yeah, step definitely, back. Definitely. And the fear. We have to, yeah, we have to, and the fear, absolutely. And we just have to step back, pause, you know, as they say, practice the pause, right? And understand that um, DEIB is not this new novel concept, oh, this buzzword, no. It is an integral component to collective success. Please correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, and I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. Like when you were talking about ER, when you expanded on ERGs, um, from what you had just said also, it's like, um, it, it's going to take um, everybody. So with ERGs, there needs to be leadership involved in each year, in every ERG that your organization may want to start. It needs to be leadership supported. And in order for that to happen, a leader needs to help um, or at least be on the attendance list every time or, or be the, 
the uh, go-to person uh, for for that ERG because um, that that's you, all part of inclusive leadership. You, oh my gosh, that's worthy of repetition, Andrea. Because mm -hmm. I look at the flip side of the situation, right? If an organization strives, okay, let me let me paraphrase. If certain individuals within an organization see the value in ERGs mm -hmm. and it is not leadership supported, what do you think is going to be the end result? No one's going to go. <laughs> it's going to fizzle out. I mean, it, it, and we've all seen, we've all been in in uh, groups like that at, at or um, or most of us are said to say I shouldn't say assume I should not assume most of us have been in um, uh, groups that uh, or clubs or. Um, uh, teams that have fizzled out at, at workplaces or even at school. It needs to be teacher supported or or administrator administrator supported supported. Absolutely. Um so it's um yeah um because that's gonna show everyone employees or students that it matters. It matters because um and it's more than just lip service because the leaders are showing up. And, and that means it's, it's important to them and they are modeling the behavior that's, that's expected. And it's also important to note that, to, so if you have a, a, um, an ERG for Latinx professionals or an ERG for uh, black professionals or Asian professionals, you don't have to be black, Asian or, or Latinx to be a part of those groups. I encourage everybody to join groups that they're, they're, they, they don't really truly fully identify with, but want to learn more about and support. Um, it's an ERG is a way of supporting those, um, um, whatever that ERG is about. So, and. Uh, and I think, I think just to, to, to add on to the, the, the true value of ERGs, I think you, you highlighted something so important, which is uh, you don't necessarily have to be a member of that specific group, right? You, it yeah. is, it is the whole purpose of the ERGs is to, to, to build that environment uh, of, of inclusiveness, right? Mm -hmm. um, to build that environment that encourages um, being more open-minded and being more and having a desire to to be more knowledgeable of those differing groups and then therefore realize that realize that there is true value to be had through these ERGs, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, because the only way you're going to expand your emotional intelligence is to expand your expose or to expose yourself to um, unfamiliar um, topics and, and, and individuals and cultures. Um, that's going to, expand your emotional intelligence by expanding your empathy and um it, yeah it's just it's a domino effect so um so i want to be cognizant of time uh do you have anything else you'd like to talk about when it comes to emotional intelligence if not i'll talk about the key takeaways and um some uh, possible next steps for our listeners well, Andrea, I want to first uh, express my heartfelt gratitude for having me as your first Likewise. guest. Likewise. Um, I truly I, enjoyed our conversation. I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I wish you loads and loads of success. Um, yeah. And I, I, I hope to be a continuous partner of yours. Yeah. Um, and uh, as far as our message today, I think I would just like to close with saying that um, we as a society, in order to truly understand the concept of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, mm -hmm. we really need to look within and realize we need to do some self-introspection mm -hmm. and realize that we're all different, yet we all deserve mm -hmm. to be respected and appreciated. And what do we as a collective need to do? to what measures do need to be taken in order to decrease divisiveness. And yeah. I think that would be my message to, to open, you know, for us to, as a society to open our minds to, to, to understanding this relationship between emotional intelligence and, and building uh, inclusive spaces. Beautifully said. 
Yeah, and thank you so very much once thank again. You. Uh, thank you for, for coming on. Yeah. <laughs> so if people want to get a hold of you, because uh, you're uh, wanting to uh, expand into the uh, DEI consulting, from what um, I remember you telling me, and uh, you're looking for um, additional uh, also speaking engagements as well, from what I remember, correct? So how can people get a hold of you? And I'll make sure to uh, uh, put um, a, a slide at the end of the podcast with uh, how the information you want as well, that, that you state right now as well. Absolutely, Andrea. Thank you so very much. Uh, I sincerely appreciate that. So yes, uh, Andrea, you are correct in stating that um, uh, I am indeed career pivoting into the DEIB space. I am looking to develop my public speaking career as well. I have some clearly defined goals set for myself for the year of 2024. Mm -hmm. um, if any, if anyone uh, would like to contact me, um, just to you know, for uh, to connect or consultation or for any uh, speaking opportunities, uh, I. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, so Monica Cotri. Um, my last name is spelled K-H-A-T-R-I. Um, we can connect via LinkedIn. Uh, or you can also reach me um, via email. And that's okay. Monica Cotri 2002 at yahoo.com. I know I must be the only individual on the planet with an Yahoo email. <laughs> I still have one. I still have one. <laughs> I, I will be will be happy to connect. Um, my next goal is to be able to spearhead a LinkedIn event uh, on this topic of DEIB and, and empathy and, and emotional intelligence. So I, uh, I would love to connect and thank you so much. You are very welcome. So, um, and as I said, I will make sure to put a slide up with the information at the end. Of it. Key takeaways from our episode today, EQ as a foundation. Understand that emotional intelligence or EQ serves as the foundation for fostering inclusivity and a sense of belonging in the workplace. Recognize the role of self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, and interpersonal skills in creating a positive and inclusive organizational or educational culture. The impact on workplace or educational dynamics. We explored how high levels of emotional intelligence among leaders and team members contribute to improved communication, collaboration, and conflict resolution. We also discussed real-world examples of how emotional intelligence positively influences workplace relationships and overall organizational effectiveness, inclusivity and diversity. Monica and I examined the connection between emotional intelligence and creating an inclusive environment that values and celebrates diversity. We highlighted how EQ enhances cultural competence, promotes active listening, and helps mitigate unconscious biases within the workplace or, or the classroom. The leadership's role. We emphasize the critical role of leadership in setting the tone for emotional intelligence within an organization. We also discuss strategies for developing and nurturing emotional intelligence among leaders to create a more inclusive and supportive work culture. And continuous learning and growth. We encourage the idea that emotional intelligence is a skill that can be developed and strengthened over time. And we provided resources and suggestions for ongoing learning opportunities workshops and tools that can help individuals and organizations enhance their emotional intelligence. So uh, possible next steps for learners, self-assessment, encourage, uh, sorry, I encourage you to reflect on your own emo emotional intelligence by considering areas of strength and areas for improvement. Training and development. Um, so uh, Monica and I talked about some books um, and that you can look at uh, or read, um, check out, buy and read, look for workshops, DEI workshops, uh, different professional development workshops that will enhance your emotional intelligence or your DEI um, knowledge or online courses that focus on emotional intelligence and or DEI uh, for those that are looking to enhance your, um, their skills. Um, I recommend incorporating team building exercises that specifically target emotional intelligence within your workplace. Uh, if you're a leader in your organization or, or if you're an administrator in your um, educational institution, I suggest seeking out leadership development programs that emphasize emotional intelligence as a core competency. So Harvard Business School has a beautiful 
uh, Emotional Intelligence and Leadership. There are quite a few others uh, program, but there are quite a few other organizations that have um, EQ focused um, leadership um, uh, programs that you can look at. And then just ongoing learning. Uh, you know, um, look for continuous learning. Um, I, I'll put some uh, uh, I, some workshops and um, programs that, at the end of this podcast in the description uh, of the podcast, so uh, you can uh, refer to those uh, suggested learnings. So, um, and some of them will include articles and in other people's podcasts, like Jennifer Brown. I love her podcast um, and uh, webinars as well that you can look at. So you can. Uh, engage in the topic on emotional intelligence, intelligence and inclusivity. So those are some suggested possible next steps for, for all you listeners. So thank you so much uh, for listening. Monica, thank you for uh, being on my podcast, Get Diverse Infused. Um, I um, hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And um, I will, I can't wait to speak with you all again in my next episode. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Wishing you all the best. Thank you. Now go out there and make a difference. And as always, for more strategies on building inclusive workplaces and communities, check out Diversifuse. We're here to guide you on your DEI journey. Make sure to visit our website at diversifuse.com and follow us on social media for the latest happenings, blog posts, tips, and events. Um, um, um.